It's an encouraging crowd here this evening. Good to see you. Uh, we have, for those who are viewing online, we still have our pews roped off every other pew, so we're sitting every other pew. Uh, there are maybe a few seats left. Might be kind of like the man who went to the uh, Kleptomaniacs Anonymous meeting and all the seats were taken. Uh, <laughs> So it's good to see you, and I'm glad you found a place, and those who are with us online, we're thankful for that. Appreciate you joining us uh, here this evening. We have been on Sunday evenings looking at your Bible questions, which you have submitted. Uh, you may submit these by email or by text or just hand us a card or something written so that we'll have them, and uh, our intent is to follow what the scriptures uh, teach on these matters, to uh, search out scriptural answers for these Bible questions. Your questions indicate interest on your part, and we very much appreciate receiving them and the privilege of, uh, of dealing with them. Our question for this evening can be stated this way, is it scriptural to continue to worship in a congregation that does not and cannot appoint elders? That is, a, I th think, an exact quote of the question that we received some time ago. Is it scriptural to continue to worship in a congregation that does not and cannot appoint elders? Let me just say, in approaching this question from a biblical background, that whenever we talk about the organization of the church, it's very, very important that we differentiate between the Lord's church, which is fully described in the word of God, in its structure and its organization, its worship, its work, its purpose. It's important that we differentiate between the Lord's church and the churches of men. Because I'm sure you know that the various denominations that have been started up down through the years have really departed. I'm sorry to say they have departed in, in many ways from the scriptural pattern. In fact, this is one of the first areas of departure as we read about church history down through the years was in the leadership of the church. And that should not surprise us. The Apostle Paul, for example, in speaking to church leaders in Acts chapter 20 said, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, speaking to elders, not sparing the flock. And so it's, it's no surprise to us that in the area of church organization, church leadership, this was where the first departures really came in. And first thing you know, you had, instead of the scriptural pattern, you began to see uh, an elder from each congregation getting together, meeting among themselves, and sort of exercising oversight over a group of congregations. And you might have a head elder, for example, or one elder that was elevated above the others. And instead of referring to him as a bishop, he might be referred to as an archbishop. See, someone who's over, overarching the others. And many other departures like that, about which we read nothing in the scriptures. So I would urge and plead with those who may be watching online, who come perhaps from a denomination or a church where you have seen a difference between what's happening there and the scriptures, a difference from the word of God, that you would seriously consider this area. And I'm gonna use this question as a sort of an opportunity to encourage that. And that we try extra hard to go back to the scriptural pattern with respect to the Lord's church and primarily in the area of church leadership and the eldership. So let's go to a, a, what I'm going to call a description of God's plan for congregations. Open your Bible, please, to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. 
here is an epistle written by the Apostle Paul to a young gospel preacher, Titus. And so, not surprisingly, he's going to tell Titus some things about church organization, church leadership. If, and if you want to find out what is the scriptural pattern for the leadership of the congregation, you're going to want to definitely notice the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. These, sometimes called the pastoral epistles, because they deal with pastors or elders in the Lord's church. And it is surprising sometimes to people when they, when they hear that the name pastor or the, the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, translates a Greek word which means shepherd. So when you think of the eldership, in order to understand what that is, you must look at the Greek words, the original words that are translated. Pastor means shepherd, or an elder, of course meaning one who, who is older, wiser, presumably more experienced in the faith. Bishop, indicating an ex a level of authority and uh, oversight. These words, are used interchangeably in the New Testament to refer to the spiritual leaders of God's people in the local church. So here, for example, at Central, currently we have three men serving faithfully in the role of elders, elder, in the eldership. It is perfectly in order and scriptural to refer to them as bishops or shepherds, overseers, elders. These words are not words of title as in some official titling capacity, but they describe their, their job, their role, their duties, what they do. And all of them work together. They are a team. They are an eldership. In the Bible, we don't read about head elders or one elder having the, the charge over the other elders and somehow being senior to the others. It is a body of men who are qualified, according to the word of God, to lead his people. So that's what we find in 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Notice especially verse 5 here. I'm going to put this on the screen because Paul is telling Titus what to do with respect to the organization of the church, the various congregations. And so he says there, for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou should set in order the things that were wanting and appoint elders in every city as I gave thee charge. Notice two things there. Setting in order suggests to organize, to arrange the leadership of the congregation so that the church can proceed in an orderly fashion. One of the big problems with a congregation which has no elders, no eldership, is the challenge of achieving orderliness. Because what an eldership does is to set things in order. I don't know of any faithful elder in the Lord's church who wouldn't agree that they definitely do not ever want to go back to a situation where there are no elders. They remember those men's business meetings and those other efforts to try to govern and lead and proceed and advance the work of the church without elders. It is inefficient, it's difficult, 
it often is divisive. It can lead to many, many problems. And it's just not the plan that the scriptures prescribe. I left you in Crete, Paul says to Titus, that you would, so that you should set in order the things that were wanting. And the word wanting there, of course, suggests the idea of incompletion, lacking. It's lacking. It's not the way it should be. That you should set in order the things that were wanting and do what, Titus? Appoint elders. In every city, now notice, the congregations which met in the various cities, and we read about these in the various epistles there in the New Testament, churches like the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, the churches of Galatia, and so on. These represent congregations in the various cities of that day. So today, when you read about the church in Martinsburg or in whatever city it, you, you want to name, the principle is the same. It, 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 the application is the same. When we don't have elders, we're lacking. We're wanting. The scriptures speak of appointing elders in every city. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. You remember on Sunday mornings, uh, several weeks ago, several months ago now, we had a short series of sermons called Stepping Up. Rising to the challenges of Christian leadership. You remember we talked about the qualifications of elders, the appointment of elders, the role of elders, their duties, and so on. One of the things that is absolutely essential here at Central, that, that our elders have recognized as being essential, is a constant need to stress the development of spiritual leadership. And we sometimes forget about that. We think, oh, we've got an eldership. Everything is going along fine. And some congregations are kind of lulled into a false sense of security, thinking, well, everything is as it should be. And, and we don't pay attention to the need to continue to build and develop new leaders. Until a crisis occurs where maybe we're down to two elders and one of them suddenly is ill, not able to perform his duties, what happens? Well, we haven't been looking ahead, have we? Haven't been planning for the future and developing leaders. And so both elders, deacons, uh, Bible class teachers, all forms of spiritual leadership must be developed and planned for. And it is a challenge to, that we need to be rising to constantly. That's why our elders currently, almost every Sunday morning, you'll say, well, where are the elders? Why aren't they going out to the steakhouse with us? <laughs> well, it's because they're meeting somewhere back here, meeting with men or uh, uh, others trying to plan for leadership. And uh, they're, they're constantly concerned about that. Uh, so maybe you are thinking, you know, I need to step up to the challenge of Christian leadership myself. And, and, and if so, I hope you will make that known to our elders, your desire to serve in this way. Leaders are not born. They are made, and it is a process of growth and development and effort and diligence. It is a work. It's not just a, a fortuitous accident that somebody suddenly one day gets, gets appointed as an elder. They've been working toward that goal for years, really since, since very early years in their life. You parents understand this. You, you hopefully are teaching your children from the earliest days to grow to spiritual leadership. And incidentally, this isn't just for men. Uh, it is, it's a challenge to be an elder's wife. 
It is harder to be an elder's wife than it is to be an elder. And so there is a special period of training and growth and maturity and prayer that goes into planning for that type of leadership. The scriptural organization of congregations could be, I think, concisely stated with the following sentence. Every congregation, when fully and scripturally organized, will have elders, duly appointed and biblically qualified, period. Every congregation, when fully and scripturally organized, will have elders, duly appointed and biblical qualified. Now, I think we all recognize that there is a time, at least in the early life of a congregation, where we are working toward that goal. The congregation is first organized, may not have men who are qualified yet to serve as elders. Many of you have been there, as I have. It's a challenging time. It is not an easy time. But there comes a time when the congregation should be fully and scripturally organized. So that brings us then in, let's, let's, let's uh, pivot here and bear down a little bit directly on this question that was submitted. What do we do until we have elders? Suppose that you are worshiping with a congregation that does not yet have elders, or maybe you're watching online and worshiping in such a congregation, or to our own members. There may come a time where, where you, are, you relocate, move to an area where you're with a congregation that does not yet have elders. What do you do? Well, first, let me observe, just as a matter of fact, that this is more common in areas where the churches are few in number, you go into areas uh, of our country where uh, the, the congregations are more numerous, you may not ever have to deal with this problem. But in some parts of the country, as you know, churches of Christ are few and far between. And those that there are may be relatively small in number. They may not have elders. So what do you do? You're a member there. Let me give you a few, what I hope be helpful, scriptural suggestions along that line. Number one, pray for growth and maturity. Pray for growth and maturity of that congregation. Now, please do not be offended at this. If you're watching online and you attend a congregation that does not yet have elders, but the fact is, the reality is that that congregation needs to grow and mature. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that Titus was to set in order the things that were wanting and appoint elders in every city. So if we're in a congregation where there are no elders yet, that tells me that some growth needs to take place. And we should be praying for that growth, spiritual growth and maturity. I fear sometimes, brethren, that we are tempted to fall into sort of a holding pattern where we think this is, this is normal, this is the way it's always going to be. And it is possible to stop striving, to stop growing toward fully organized leadership and maturity. So we should pray for that. We should pray for that privately. We should pray for that publicly. The prayers in such a congregation should, I think, regularly include that kind of request, that the Lord will help us to grow and develop spiritually so that we may have a fully developed spiritual leadership. Number two, there should be preaching and teaching about biblical organization. The verse that I mentioned from Titus chapter 1 there is just one verse 
among many which teach the principles that we're discuss discussing here this evening. The Lord's church is compared in the Bible to a human body. Jesus Christ himself being the head of the body. But every member being uh, knit together, as it were, joined together in uh, mutual support and that which every joint supplieth, working together as a human body should work together in a common effort and purpose. Well, that in order to achieve that, there's going to have to be preaching and teaching along that line. It's not going to happen accidentally. I said at the beginning that this is one of the areas that for some reason we are prone to depart from the truth in first of all. So I would, I would suggest that we be preaching and teaching. And, and that's why even in a congregation with elders, a good, sound, faithful eldership, still there needs to be regular preaching and teaching along that line. Occasionally somebody say, Bob, why you, why you preach on stepping up to Christian leadership? We have leaders. Yes, we do. But there needs to continue to be preaching and teaching about biblical organization of the church and the leadership of the church. And related to that, number three, is to work to become fully organized. You do know, don't you, that there are very capable gospel preachers and teachers who conduct seminars and lectures and gospel meetings devoted to this very theme. It seems to me that if a congregation is really serious about developing an eldership, you might want to be aware of that and consider that. Also, a, a plentitude of good scriptural literature, books that have been written and, and articles that have been written by our brethren that should be read and considered prayerfully. And that those men who might consider themselves as potentially being able to serve in that capacity are going to have to really work at it and, and be, take that seriously. Let me just mention incidentally here at Central, if you are not one of our men here, you're not yet serving as an elder or a deacon, but you feel that that would be a possibility for you, that it's going to take work and effort. And I would urge you to make that of high priority in your life. It'll produce great blessings in your life, but it's not going to come easily. Work to become fully organized. Number four, so important. Speak well of God's way. I can't tell you how disappointed I was the, the, the first time I really remember hearing, and this has been a number of years ago, hearing elderships disparaged from the pulpit or hearing a preacher say bad things about elderships from someplace else. No, this eldership did that and that eldership did that and it was just, it was like if I, if I were listening to that kind of preaching all of the time, I would get the impression that elderships is a bad thing. Now, maybe I'm the only one who has had that experience. I, I hope so, but I doubt it. I think that, that we have all probably heard elderships joked about or ridiculed or mocked in some way, maybe by some preacher or teacher. Maybe they were meaning well, but I think this is productive of much harm. It is not a good thing. We need to be speaking well of elderships because elderships represent God's way. And I don't wanna give anybody the impression that God's way is unworkable or unreachable, that we, unattainable, we, can't, we can never get there. Here. Oh yes, we can. 
if we'll stop disparaging God's way and start speaking well of it. And then lastly, number five, to encourage and support those who desire the eldership. Young man, if you are thinking about serving as an elder in the Lord's church, and I know about it, if I know that you're thinking of serving in that way, I want to encourage you in every way that I can to pursue that. You can do it. And young ladies, as an elder's wife, why would we hear about a young man who wants to serve as an elder? Why would we put him down and, and act like he is out of bounds or, or not, not you know, out of line for seeking that position? Why would we do that? Is it jealousy? Envy? I have wondered about that because occasionally I, I will hear somebody putting somebody down because, oh, well, they want to be an elder. Listen, that's a good thing. Now, they may never reach that, that peak of service in the kingdom of God. They're, let me tell you something. Once it becomes known that you want to serve as an elder or a deacon, Satan, it's, it's kind of like he's going to train his sights on you even a little more. Be careful. I, I really pray for those who, in a congregation, are considering serving in leadership. Because... You, you're going to need prayer. And I don't mean to discourage anybody, but here again, Satan is after the leaders of the church. They have targets on them in a spiritual sense, and they need our prayers, and they need our encouragement, and they need our support. And not just those that are currently serving, but those who are desiring one of these days to, to serve. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, If any man seeketh the office of a bishop or an elder, he desireth a good work. He desireth a good work. So, young man, if you are seeking to one day serve as an elder, I commend you in that because you're seeking a good thing. That's a good goal to have. And ladies, as an elder's wife, that's a good goal to have. I would encourage you and I would encourage all of us to support such thinking. What do you do if you're in a congregation like that? Well, here's what you do. You pray for growth and maturity. You preach and teach about biblical organization. You work to become fully organized. You speak well of God's way, never put it down and you encourage and support those who are desiring the eldership. I don't know how long it will take for, for that congregation, whatever it is, whichever, wherever it may be, to achieve a scriptural eldership. But I believe that this is God's plan and that God's plan is the best way and that's the way we should be moving, wherever we are, always in line with God's plan for spiritual leadership in the church. So I hope that those thoughts are helpful to you. Can you worship there scripturally? Yes. And hopefully doing these five things will help you uh, to do so. This evening, if you are not a child of God, if you're not a, yet a member of the Lord's church, uh, let me encourage you to think about the beauty of his plan for the church. Man, there is no organization, none of these man-made denominations can begin to compare with the Lord's church. If you're not a Christian, not yet a member of the body of Christ, then our Lord invites you, urges you to come into a, the fold of safety where there is rest and room, into a place of salvation where your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, by hearing the gospel and believing it, by repenting of your sins and confessing your faith and being baptized into the body, the church of Jesus Christ. And now, why tarriest thou? 
Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. If you're subject to that great invitation, 